Good morning. This is Bill from Curious Cars on a, you know, it's a slightly better Florida morning. It's in the 60s. It's not terribly bad, unlike yesterday's humid swamp. And, uh, you know, it feels okay. But the truth is, it's going to be hot as balls later on. And, you know, I'm just not really getting any reprieve from the, uh, from the baking weather, the tropical weather that I'm looking to avoid. But nobody really cares about that anyway. But, you know, it's cathartic for me to say so. It just helps me get through the day knowing that I can gripe and bitch and complain uh, that we're being cheated out of yet another winter. But uh, that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, you know, it's been, again, I know I haven't had many videos up. Uh, I've been working my ass off trying to get all these cars ready for this uh, premiere auction coming up. Actually, this Friday it's coming up, December 2nd. And uh, we've got a bunch of things going through. You know, it's been quite a challenge getting them ready, but they have, and here we are. Uh, the hard work just keeps continuing. Um, you know, look, if you're in Punta Gorda, it might be worth stopping by. There's a lot of cool cars there. Uh, it's also, of course, online. I think you can do it on that proxy bid site. And uh, I'll put a link to the auction in the uh, description beneath. So if you have any interest in any of the stuff, you can, you know, do it from Skokie or Helsinki or wherever the hell you happen to be. But uh, there's going to be some pretty neat stuff there. Um, this car presented a particular challenge for me. Uh, I bought it a couple of months ago. It was more or less a barn find. Not exactly a barn find, but kind of a barn find. Uh, it had been owned by two different dealers over the course of the last 33 years. Uh, both of them kind of speculating on it. You know, they bought it, they were charmed by it, they didn't want to sell it. Uh, the first guy kept it for like seven or eight years, and uh, the second guy kept it for over 20. So, uh, and it drove like almost, it has 28,000 miles on it. It was 25 in 1990, so it's driven about 3,000 miles uh, in the last 33 years. And uh, as a result, I didn't want to just hop in the damn thing and start driving it. Uh, you know, again, it's basically a barn find, and even though it was well stored, you know, that just doesn't help the mechanicals of a car. So, uh, to feel safe, uh, I had to put in, first things first, a new timing belt. I don't even know if this is an interference motor or not, but I'm just going to assume it is, and uh, decided I needed to get one. Well, that presented a challenge. Uh, you know, it also got some other stuff. It got tires, it got all the fluids flushed, uh, it got uh, new engine mounts installed, a new tranny a new transmission mount uh, on these Vegas. They were actually big rubber affairs designed to really cut down the buzziness of the four cylinder. So that was important. And uh, of course it also had to get detailed through, uh, you know, 30 years of storage and dust and that sort of thing. So uh, it was actually a, a fairly intensive project. And because this was such a limited production car, uh, it's not that easy to find stuff for it. I mean, it's all out there, but you really got to go after it. Uh, to get it, I had to join the Cosworth Vega Owners Association, and I don't know why, but it immediately pulls up visions of the mutton shop guys at the SCCA events, you know, these sort of fastidious uh, facial hair dudes who love, you know, looking at the old Sun Instrument readouts. When <laughs> it's just, you know, those type of guys. Anyway, I joined their club. That was a nightmare. For the, the website didn't work easily, so it took an extra week just to get a login. Uh, but once I did, I was, you know, opened up to a whole world of information, tech manuals, and parts for Cosworth Vegas uh, that eventually did get the ball rolling. And uh, so here we are today. Uh, and again, 19 1975 Chevrolet Cosworth Vega. Two million Vegas were built between 1971 and 1977. And the Vega wasn't considered a particularly successful car, uh, but two million of them were built. Uh, of those, 3,508 uh, were Cosworth models. 
made across only two years of production. In the same two years, they made 190,000 base Vegas. So the cars are rare, very rare, really. Again, they made more Ferrari Daytonas than they did these things. And frankly, every Daytona was saved, uh, while a lot of these cars ended up in the scrap heap. So there's even fewer today than were built. Um, and, you know, it's weird because they're significant. Uh, you know, it's, it's a rare car, but there's just more to it than that. The cars are actually very historically significant, at least in terms of the car business. And they're a little bit overlooked today. And, you know, that's changing, I guess, as people sort of realize what they were. Uh, but there's a reason that they were overlooked. And, you know, for many years, Vegas, and still today, Vegas are kind of the redheaded stepchild of the uh, collector car world. Uh, it all started with a guy, as a lot of these stories do, uh, named John Z. DeLorean. And that name, of course, is not terribly uncommon to any of the performance stories coming out of GM. You know, he's the guy who uh, took part in revitalizing Pontiac, who, you know, went on to Chevrolet. He is credited with the GTO at Pontiac. Uh, eventually built his own stainless steel car that would time travel years later. And even that had some parallels to this one because it wasn't as appreciated in its day as it is afterwards. And uh, that is true of these Vegas as well. Um, uh, anyway, in 1969, he was appointed the general manager of Chevrolet. I think he was also the vice president of GM at the time, but he was GM of Chevy. And that, mean, uh, that meant the task to promote uh, the all-new subcompact 71 Vega fell on his shoulders. And that would be a small, light car. Uh, intended to compete with the growing threat from European auto. You know, the bunch of young hipsters were out buying MGBs and uh, Alfa Romeos and, you know, Porsche 356s, that sort of thing. And uh, the GM wanted a part of that. They, they wanted to have a car that could compete with that. Uh, and the Vega was going to be it. Well, to, to a certain extent. I mean, not certainly on the high end of the Porsche. But it would be small. It would be light. It would get good fuel mileage. It would handle well, and uh, it might even be fun to drive. And uh, DeLorean was tasked with selling that. Um, later on, he argued that, you know, he was put in a position where he had to sort of tout this car that he wasn't entirely comfortable or confident in. And uh, that's a different story altogether. Uh, but uh, anyway, he started doing it. And, uh, you know, the car came out with an all new 2.3 liter aluminum four cylinder. That was a pretty big deal for GM. Uh, it was developed in tandem with the uh, Reynolds company, you know, the guys who make the Reynolds wrap, uh, obviously aluminum specialty people. And uh, they built this thing and they thought they had built it in such a way uh, that it would be durable. Initial tests showed it would, you know, that it didn't need cylinder liners on this aluminum block. Well, that would prove pretty fucked up later on, but we'll get into that. Uh, and anyway, when they, you know, the car came out, DeLorean thought, man, you know, this is a cool little four-cylinder engine. We're going to make a racing version of that that's going to bring Chevrolet glory on the racetrack. Uh, so he hit up England's Formula One engine-building gurus at Cosworth. Uh, truly, and again, all going to the significance of this car, uh, you know, one of the first real international collaborations that would become more standard in later years, but wasn't really done back then. So uh, DeLorean went to Cosworth and said, hey, here's this little engine. Make it into something that uh, that will race. We'll put it in like little Lolas and, you know, open-wheeled cars, and it, it'll do great on the racetrack. So Cosworth agreed. They thought it looked like a cool plan. They started building the thing. And uh, it worked well. Uh, a street engine of the car was also planned, which is, you know, what we're looking at today. But that was more of a side project. Uh, the results were good initially. Um, Cosworth tweaked the displacement. They brought it down to two liters, which it had to be to uh, qualify for certain classes of racing. Uh, they added a forged steel crank to, you know, give it strength, aluminum rods and pistons for lightness and revy potential. And, uh, and the big thing, the cherry on top, is they topped it with a very fancy twin cam 16 valve aluminum head with two big side draft Webers on it. And it absolutely 
screamed. Uh, for a little engine like that, it just absolutely screamed. They were getting 270 horsepower out of it, uh, which was all well and good. I mean, it was pushing these little race cars uh, around the track at insane speeds, and they were doing quite well. Uh, and everything looked great until the engine block started disintegrating. You know, the uh, blocks would crack, the, the pistons would get wallowed out. Uh, it just didn't work well at all after the cars were run for a little while. And Cosworth did what they could to beef up the durability. Uh, but uh, when they couldn't, they just gave up after uh, repeated failures. And this is not a terribly different story from the uh, fate of the regular Vega, the production Vega that came out in 71. Uh, it was such an important car for GM, and it was it was pushed corporately. Uh, you know, they had to get it out. They wanted it out in a hurry. So in just 24 months, it went from design to production and uh, quickly developed a reputation as a terribly built car. Uh, six out of seven early production Vegas were recalled. Six out of seven uh, for one reason or another or several reasons or another. Uh, you know, it, it, in fact, the engine box, which, you know, uh, GM had been so proud of, proved to be a disaster. After 40,000 miles, the lack of cylinder liners uh, would um, uh, end up wallowing out the cylinder walls and they'd start chewing up you know, oil and piston rings and, you know, coolant would leak in and it just turned into an absolute disaster. They had to replace a bunch of engine blocks on these cars under warranty. And uh, even though it was considered kind of a failure of design by the general public, they thought the Vega was a terrible car. Uh, the truth is it was more a failure of R&D. You know, the, the car should have been bench tested, if you will, a lot better before it was released. Uh, GM forewent, for, they, they, they didn't do the testing on the car that they should, the durability testing, the long-term testing. They passed that on to the customer who paid the price, and of course the dealers as well, you know, who were forced to handle all the complaints and the warranty claims that would come in on them. And uh, it just blossomed into an absolute PR disaster for GM. I mean, the cars were considered awful. There was a variety of reasons for it, the engines being the main one, but not only. Uh, you know, the way they had designed the body, uh, the uh, rust proofing didn't quite work. And I mean, there were instances of these things rusting on the showroom floor. Uh, the paint quality was terrible. Uh, you know, the 71 Vegas were just considered awful, awful cars. People liked the looks of them and they went out and bought them and then very quickly went on to rev uh, regret their decisions. Uh, so the Cosworth Vega project, which had been around since you know, DeLorean wanted to build this racing engine became a big deal because it was going to be his attempt to salvage the model. Uh, he believed a high performance, well built version with cutting edge technology uh, would seal the sort of open wound that Chevy had. Uh, incurred and get the car back on track in the public eye. Uh, so he pushed it, man. Over a lot of GM opposition, he decided to keep pushing for this special twin cam edition, and he did. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the quickly heightening emissions and safety standards of the time, the early Malays era, uh, they got in the way. I mean, the car was a year too late, a couple of years earlier, and it would have gotten in under the wire, and it might have been great. As it were, as it was, that didn't happen. Uh, it was supposed to come out in 73. That didn't happen. It was delayed. Then it was going to come out in 74. Uh, but in the final round of emissions testing, where they had to run like three engines for 400 hours, uh, by the end of it, a couple of the valves had gone off, and the car was putting out way more emissions than was federally acceptable. So they had to fix that. So the delay came again. Even though dealers had taken all kinds of deposits on these things, uh, it now got pushed off to the 1975 model year. And, uh, you know, by that time, Chevy had cured many of the Vega's quality control problems, but the reputation persisted. Uh, in fact, it had maybe even gotten worse, and the Vega was something of a running joke, uh, which, again, is sort of 
It's just sort of a very sad story because by the time this car came out in 75, uh, it ended up acing the emission standards, by the way. All three engines ran perfectly for like the 400 hours. One of them in the factory tune even passed California emission standards after it was over, which allowed the car to be certified in all 50 states just in its factory trim. And, uh, you know, that was the only car in the 1970s that could make that claim. So, unfortunately, emission standards don't really sell a car. So it's a shame that, you know, the 50 state certification just didn't really matter all that much. But by the time this thing hit the streets in 1975, the reputation of the Vega was sealed in the public eye. They didn't like it. They thought it was a piece of shit. They didn't want to buy it. And, uh, and it was a real problem. So, uh, you know, a... All of that, you know, all of that, all of the emission stuff, all of the safety stuff, it took a toll on the original plan for performance, which would have been what made this car great. Uh, the racing-inspired engine was meant to have 170 horsepower in street form. Well, it ended up with 110, which wasn't all that different from like a 73 Vega with the optional carburetor. It had about the same horsepower and torque. So this big, fancy engine really didn't take them that far at least in terms of statistics. Uh, heavier bumpers, you see these big five mile an hour, you know, they're aluminum, which helps, but they're still big and not what the original Vega was designed for, and they didn't help with weight. And uh, as a result, you know, it hurt performance. Lightness is the friend of performance, and heaviness is the enemy of performance and balance. So uh, it was just, a, you know, a bunch of bunch of stuff collaborated to really hurt the reputation of this car, which is absolutely a shame. To make matters worse, if they could be, the 1975, this car, this Cosworth Vega, had a base price, base price, of just under 6000 uh, bucks. To put that in perspective, it was double the price of a standard base Vega. More than double the price. Uh, it was $900 less than a Corvette. Uh, it was the second most expensive Chevrolet offered in 1975. I mean, it cost a absolute fortune. Uh, for comparison, you could buy a V8-powered LT Camaro uh, for about 3700 bucks. a much bigger, truly more substantial car, at least when you're walking in a showroom looking at them, uh, than this thing. And you'd have to add another two grand plus to buy it. Uh, so obviously, as high-tech and as cool as it was, it was still a Vega and still suffered from the horrendous reputation of the earlier models. Uh, Chevy doubling down on the shocking sticker price really didn't help either. They advertised this thing as one Vega for the price of two, uh, which they probably thought was very clever at the time, but, you know, frankly wasn't. Uh, they hoped to sell 5,000 of these special cars a year. Uh, instead, they sold 2,061 uh, in 1975. That was it. That, that was all they could muster. Uh, the, all of them were black, all of them had the gold trim, uh, debatably a color scheme inspired by the John Player Special Lotus Cosworth Racing Team. There's some argument that it isn't, that it was on some previous, um, the, you know, the, uh, special car, whatever, that uh, pre-production kind of whatever car. But, uh, you know, I think you look at the car, you say it was probably John Player Special that played a role in it in Cosworth. I mean, it made the most sense. Uh, but um, uh, that was the only way you could get them. Uh, they look like bandit Trans Ams before there were bandit Trans Ams. You know, they're all black. They've got gold trim. They've got gold wheels. Uh, you know, everything about them looks very bandity to me. Uh, even down to this gold uh, machine-termed aluminum instrument cluster inside. So, you know, you look at a Bandit Trans Am, and it looks pretty cool, but it wasn't the original. This thing was out before it. And, uh, you know, it looked to me quite striking, but sales were bad, so in 1976, they upped the car to have the full color palette of the Vega lineup. You could now get it in like 10 different colors. Um, and they added available options like a sunroof and an 8-track player. Well, you know, that didn't really help either because only 1,447 of them were sold 
1976, and production of the Twin Cam project was halted at the end of the year. So that was it. Uh, two years only. Uh, and let them over 3,500 built. And uh, GM had already built 5,000 of these kind of expensive engines for it. The unsold remainder were eventually parted out uh, or scrapped altogether at a great write-off cost into the 80s. They stored them for a long time and then just got rid of them. And uh, it was just a shame. Despite all of this, the automotive press absolutely loved the Cosworth Vega uh, with a couple of large asterisks. I I mean, most agreed that it was too little and too late uh, to undo the damage done by the uh, poor quality of the initial production Vegas. The reputation was already sealed uh, before the twin cam arrived. And uh, they also thought that the missing 60 horsepower that it should have had uh, would have put it in another league altogether. And I tend to agree with that after driving it. If it had come out just a little bit earlier, just a couple of before the emissions kicked into full effect with 170 horsepower of four speed looking the way it does, balanced the way it is, uh, it would have been a very, very different world, and it might even have saved the reputation of the Vega. So, uh, anyway, look, there it is. I'm going to take a little break there, uh, get my shit together, and then we're going to hop into this car specifically. So, bear with me one moment. All right, so we're going to do things a little bit differently today and start with under the hood because far and away, that is the most important part of the car. I mean, no question about it. So, let's get under here and pop this thing. Oh, God. All right, everything's kind of heavy. Get this prop rod in. All right, there it is. So, this is the most significant part of this car, far and away. What we have here is a two liter, again, detuned to two liters or de stroked to two liters uh, in order to meet racing standards. Uh, four cylinder inline engine with twin cam, 16 valves, all aluminum. It's got a beautiful, I wish I'd polished it, but I haven't. Uh, that's a factory stainless steel header, which is absolutely gorgeous. In stock form, uh, this should have a fuel injection system, which is actually in a box in the trunk. Uh, this one, back in 75 or 6, like many of them, uh, were converted uh, to uh, carburation. This one with the true side draft Webers that I'm going to walk around to that side uh, that Cosworth envisioned on their racing motor. So that actually added some pep to this engine, uh, but it did replace the original fuel injection, which was a computerized EFI tuned port injection. Um, it was the only one in the 1970s. I mean, there are all kinds of throttle body injections out there, but no tuned port, no port injection systems where every cylinder had its own injector, uh, you know, computer tuned to what it needed to have. And this was important for emissions at the time, uh, but also to keep up performance and power. Uh, it was the first and only American car to have true computerized tuned port injection in the 70s. And some, it wouldn't be seen again until 85 when the Corvette came out with TPI, you know, that lobster looking thing on top of the intake, and uh, was way, way, way ahead of its time. Uh, it was also the first American car to have four valves per cylinder uh, since the Duesenbergs, the insane Duesenbergs of the 1930s, which made this Cosworth Vega extremely high tech. I mean, ridiculously high tech. Uh, the costs were enormous. Every engine was hand built by a three person team in uh, Tonawanda, New York in the clean room. Uh, and, and that was a facility that had been designed to build the, uh, the famous ZL1 engines, those aluminum 427s designed for racing and made famous by the Capo Corvettes and Camaros. All of this was under the hood of a humble little entry-level Vega. I mean, Corvette still had a Rochester four-barrel. In fact, uh, Bendix built the fuel injection for this car because uh, Rochester wanted too much control over what it would be, and it didn't suit the engineers building it. So they went to Bendix, and they made a, uh, a pretty amazing fuel injection system for it. Uh, they also beefed up the suspension. It had front uh, and rear sway bars. It had stiffer springs and shocks. Uh, there was a torque arm that would 
have made her become part of the Monza, the H body that replaced the Vega and didn't do really any better than the Vega did. Uh, but it's like on a Miata or a Viper. It's this big, long structural device that sort of attaches the engine, the trans, and the uh, rear end together in a stiff sort of way that makes it, you know, much more balanced. Uh, they also put bigger brakes on it, front and rear, uh, discs, drums uh, in the back. Would have been cooler with four-wheel discs, but you get what you get. Uh, and despite the price, the rather insane, you know, $6,000 sticker this thing had, there were four things that you couldn't get on these cars. Uh, power steering, for one. Uh, power brakes you couldn't get. Uh, you couldn't get an automatic transmission. Four speed in 75. They had a five speed with overdrive available in 76. And uh, also um, air conditioning. None of those things could you get. So this black, black car, uh, I suspect they didn't sell too many of in uh, Florida or New Mexico. Uh, and for your kind of, and again, the Corvette had all of those things available for, you know, whatever you wanted to spend. So um, they just set this car up to, if you didn't think it was incredibly special and a future collector item, you probably wouldn't have bought it. And, uh, you know, that's just the way they built it at the time. Um, you know, I've got to say that as much as any other car that I've ever reviewed on this channel. Uh, this is a true uh, curious car in the true sense of the word. I mean, it's incredibly historically significant. It had all sorts of equipment on it that wouldn't show up until years later. Uh, it was built in infamy, you know, with an attempt to save a car that really couldn't be saved and uh, made in such limited production as to, to find less of them out there than Ferrari Daytonas. So, um, you know, this is why I do this channel. This is the whole reason a car like this. And frankly, I just love it. Uh, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to pause there for a minute. Uh, well, actually, I'm not. I tell you what, I'm going to open the hatch because I got a lot of crap with me today. Uh, and I'm going to have to put it in the hatch when we go for a drive so you don't need to see it all in there. Let's see what we got back here. And I think this is cool. So, uh, and of course, this is just Vega Vega. Uh, so they're all hatchbacks, which is kind of neat. That rear seat folds down, so you get more room. You know, it was a pretty utilitarian little car, and uh, kind of neat um, the way it was designed. Here's an original Cosworth Vega twin cam pamphlet that it came with. It gives you all the specs on that. Kind of interesting. And here in this box which I will open up, is the original fuel injection system. And you can see how kind of cool it looked. Uh, I'll put in a photo of the engine the way it should have been. There you see that big computer, and Bendex label right on the side of it. Uh, you know, it probably has less computing power than, you know, your average calculator that came out two or three years later. Here you see the original timing belt, which was fiberglass reinforced, but uh, there was just no way that I was going to leave that in there. That's the distributor timing belt. to Put those back in there so people would know it was changed. The original air intake. You see all of these sort of modern looking computer connections and air pumps and sensors. You know, this car again was probably 10 years ahead of its time uh, in terms of the equipment that it had under the hood, which to me is just absolutely amazing and uh, amazing more so that it wasn't on the Corvette uh, you know, or even the Impala or something, that it came out on this sort of entry-level Vega. And, uh, you know, I don't know if John Z was doing coke at that time or, you know, what people were thinking, but uh, but here it is. <laughs> anyway, I tell you what, I'll pause it there, I'll get my crap in the trunk, then we're going to hop in, look at the interior, and go for a spin. Bear with me one moment. All right, so let's have a look inside. And again, you know, I still say... You know what I forgot to do is the exterior styling. So let's say, here I am going inside. Let's have a quick walk around the car. First of all, you can see it's got a nice fast back design. I think the Vega was a really handsomely designed car. And uh, I think the, um, you know, it, it visually competed quite well uh, with the good looking stuff coming out of Europe. I like the little square taillights. Uh, I like the uh, sort of angular rear windows, the sloped back with the hatch. Uh, this had 
British sourced alloy wheels, which I think look terrific. Uh, you see, I threw new radial TA tires. I, you'd be shocked at what they cost. Uh, all the gold trim you see on this car is as it was from the factory. Uh, this thing has original paint, but it was sanded and buffed out, and then they put new decals on it before I got it, which is fine because I'm sure the ones that were on it looked tired. Uh, but the uh, you know the gold around the wheel wells that's factory. The stripe down the middle that's factory. The Cosworth twin cam the same. You see, it's got that hood power bulge uh, with uh, also gold trim around it, which is factory and looks cool. Uh, the two round lamps I think look great. I don't think it looked as good as the original 71 Vega because of the big bumpers and such. Uh, and the Vega was, of course, designed heavily influenced by the Camaro, the way it looked. And I think that helped it a lot. Uh, you see the, I don't know what the F, I found that tag on eBay, by the way. It didn't come with the car. I just, I thought it looked cool. It's probably from a Facile Vega, which they made even fewer of than, than Chevy Vegas. <laughs> so we're talking about a really rare tag, but that eh, suits the car. And I'm going to stay at Sands for F and Vega or whatever you want it to. Uh, you see it's got sport mirrors. It's got sort of cheap exposed wipers, but they look fine. There's a nice judicious use of chrome around the windshield and the tops of the doors and uh, the door handles with a little bit of blackout in the middle. Those are pop-out back windows so your you know rear passengers can vent themselves. And all in all, I think it's a very handsome and appealing car. And that is not something that's just in my mind because as I've been driving it around, it's caused a bit of a stir. You know, people say, oh my God, I haven't seen one in 40 years. Uh, even my sister and her husband thought it was incredibly good looking, uh, wondered what it was and, you know, thought the build quality <laughs> seemed nice. So, uh, you know, by the time the Cosworth came out, the Vega had it shit together, but uh, they had done so much damage that, um, that people just didn't give it a chance, which is a shame. But anyway, let's have a look inside now. And inside is a pretty cool story. So you've got twin bucket seats, which look great. Uh, I figured out that they have a, a recline mechanism, at least the driver's seat. When I first got in it, I was kind of leaned back like some kind of California lowrider and thought, you know, what the hell? And then I found that the seat could be angled forward, which was nice. But uh, anyway, good looking, you know, pleather bucket seats in this thing. Uh, had a Camaro steering wheel, the same one on a later model Z28. Looks great. Uh, it had, you know, pretty well trimmed up door panels in black. It had the bigger armrests than the standard Vega had. Little map pockets at the bottom. Probably a decent place to put a small 9mm today. But, you know, back then the big revolvers and stuff never would have fit in there. Uh, framed glass, which, you know, is fine. You know, suits a car with, you know, it makes it easier to keep it solid. Uh, the absolutely, I think, gorgeous uh, machine-turned uh, aluminum gold trim on the dash. I just think that's really cool. Uh, but anyway, we'll have a look at the back seat real quick. You got ashtrays on both sides. I think your Canadians, you know, they're going to be fairly chipper there. Uh, it's meant for two. You could probably fit three if you're on your way to a Loverboy concert or something. Uh, lots of doobies could have been smoked there with the ashtrays and everyone's going to be fairly happy uh, with actually decent legroom to be had. So uh, even being a very small car, the inside of these things was pretty roomy. Uh, let's hop in and see what we got. So you've got pretty good instrumentation. You've got your temp gauge. You've got... Uh, uh, your fuel gauge, you got a tack, you can see it redlines at 6400 RPM and uh, actually they, in testing, turned it with no problem over 9000, so the thing is very, very revvy. Uh, 120 mile an hour speedometer, you see just 28,000 miles on the clock, uh, very low miles and that is actual on this car. Uh, over here you've got your voltmeter, you've got a clock which doesn't appear to be working very well. You've got kind of a noisy fuel pump back there. It's a pulse fuel pump, and God, is it loud. I'll let it run for a minute. Uh, the Vega stereo, the original AM, is still with the car in the back, so that's kind of neat. But back in the 90s, somebody put the Sanyo cassette deck in, probably so they could listen to Elton John. Uh, this is a choke 
lever which was added to uh, help the God, that's loud. Let me turn that off. Which was added to help the uh, the Webers. Uh, here you see a nice looking floor mounted four speed gearbox with the little T handle. Looks terrific. Very very racy. Very very cool. Uh, here's your very simple climate control because of course no air conditioning. Over here you've got your electro clear rear defog, uh, your headlights and your washer wipers. Nice stuff. Uh, there you got a little oh shit pull handle on the dashboard. Uh, open up here and we've got. Um, uh, the original limited warranty, uh, GM stuff, and a uh, Cosworth Vega owner's manual, which I'm glad it has, because these things go for about a hundred bucks now. They're hard to find. And uh, otherwise, everything looking good. Up top, you got a headliner, you got pretty standard looking sun visors, and a pretty standard looking mirror. Uh, you do have an ashtray, of course, because people smoked then, and uh, a nice big uh, cigar lighter, which has gotten some use. So, properly, some 70s cats smoked in this car. Uh, let's fire it up and go for a spin. Alright, there's that Rebby little Cosworth engine. Idles at like 13 to 1500. When I first got the car, I thought that was wrong. I thought, oh my god, what the hell is it doing up there? Well, apparently that's factory correct. So, break off. And uh, that's where it should be idling. So, very, very interesting stuff. I guess that's part of the performance features of the car. Let me get my seatbelt on. Again, it's always hard to, uh, oh god, everything's hard. Now I can't get the seat belt, it's in the locked position. There we go. Right, I gotta hold the camera and cross shift, but that's what we're gonna do. I like looking down the Vista too, with that power hump in the middle and the two fender humps on the side. I think it looks kind of cool. Uh, one of the issues with this engine is it doesn't like low revs. Uh, it really only starts to get happy over 2500 into the 3000 range. You know, sort of easing into it doesn't work well. Uh, it really wants to be at high RPMs, which is of course what the car was built for. So let's give it to him. say that is incredibly fun uh, it feels very peppy it feels very revvy you can tell the engine likes being up in that range I don't have the balls to send it up to 6400 uh, which is fine because it reaches its sort of max horsepower and torque in the 5500 range you know there were some people out there who SEC ate these things uh, there was one done by um, Oh, what's her name? Oh, God, now I forgot. I can't believe I forgot her name. She was a car and driver correspondent through one of the rare, terrific female race car drivers. And uh, she famously campaigned a uh, Cosworth Vega for a couple of years, or at least a year. And they recently found that car, but it was all fucked up, so it's kind of a shame. Um, Linda Mood. Uh, Gene Linda Mood. Uh, anyway, you know, this is a fun car to drive. And that was kind of the take of the press at the time. Like, you know, if it had had the 170 horsepower, they would have said, wow, what an incredibly special piece. It's fast, it's fun, it's different. With 110 horsepower, the car was, hey, this is what the Vega should have been from the very beginning. If it had been this, if it had driven like this, if it had been fun like this, if it had been as well built as this, because of course GM got rid of most of the problems by the time this car came out, it would have sold like hotcakes. It would have been a whole different world. You might have actually had people who bought you know, 356s or BMW 2002, you know, TIIs actually looking seriously at this car uh, instead of it just sort of being, uh, you know, an asterisk in the overall sad 
the history of the Chevy Vega and how negative it was for GM. So a couple of years too late uh, for DeLorean's project to save the whole Vega lineup. Well, anyway, look, I'm stuck in early morning traffic. It's going to be absolutely shit, so I'm not going to make you suffer through it with me. Uh, this, again, is a 1975 Cosworth Vega, 28,000 original miles, a real nice time machine. It's going to be for sale uh, this weekend, Friday it runs through, at the uh, Premier Auction in Punta Gorda. And again, I'll put a link to that in the uh, description below. So if you have an interest in owning a really unusual piece of Chevrolet history that's frankly undervalued in terms of its overall significance and you know importance to uh, uh, to the evolution of uh, engine management, then you got your chance. So thank you very much for having a look. Really appreciate it. And uh, I don't think I'll get another one out this week, but we'll see you with the next one soon. Take care.